Thanks for the opportunity to share time with you. This is a recording of the session delivered November 25th at KCL. Uh, higher education uh, and the iPad. There's so much to get through that I've got a website with a link to not only this recording, but uh, the primary research case studies and any of the, some of the videos I'll be looking at. I spend a lot of time trying to look at the research to predict where technology might be taking us, educational technology. Uh, it's impossible, but the New Media Consortium's Horizon Report does a pretty good job and historically have done that. The um, research methodology is the Delphi research methodology where a number of scholars in the area get together, review the literature, debate it and look at some of the trends that are occurring. And those sort of trends on the near horizon uh, are areas such as blended learning, that's technology enhancing face-to-face. -face. You know, the research tells us that distance learning on its own has very low efficacy, so blended learning seems to engage students to a greater extent. Also learning spaces is being a, a significant area, is identified as a significant area and Prof Cox is speaking next and will be covering uh, that area. Now technologies that relate to these two trends are flipping the classroom, the flipped classroom, I would argue an over intellectualized uh, concept. It's really an extension of the Socratic method. So introducing an idea or concept, in this case using technology, uh, simulations, uh, videos and so on, exercises with apps that stimulate and engage the student before they come to that face-to-face -face session. Uh, and also this area of BYOD or one-to-one, -one. bring your own device to campus, or one-to-one -one programs such as iPads. Technology is not what it's all about. Teaching is what it's all about. Prof. Di Lorillard, who will be known to many of you uh, in the e-learning turf, pointed out that if you put technology first, learning will come second. Now, there are a number of institutions who have gone for one-to-one -one programs, an iPad in the hand of every student. I had the pleasure of talking to Hilary Baker, the CIO at Cal State Northridge recently, from Birmingham originally, and they ran a pilot, but now every student will be receiving a device to assist them in teaching and learning. Let's hear about, back from the students who were part of the pilot to see what they saw, to, saw as the strength of using these devices. But with the iPad, um, I'm learning quickly how to use it and it's really helpful. A great thing about the iPad is that I can use it anywhere, anytime, and do just about anything with it. If you have an e-book, like for your textbook, you can highlight, you can annotate, you can bookmark the page that you're on. I like it a lot better than carrying a large textbook or a whole bag full of them. I use my iPad to take notes, to record lectures, play games, email, social media, you know, the usual stuff. It's so helpful to have the iPad in class. It's amazing how you can take pictures, make videos, draw, and there's just so many ways to be creative with it. Okay, so students identified that consuming content, ebooks, using apps, collaborating, social networking, uh, uh, these are the important things. Creating as well. So we'll touch on these things. Now, a number of institutions have gone for these one-to-one -one programs. There are some smaller liberal arts colleges like Seton Hill University, Lynn University, uh, and Abilene Christian University in the US. Ohio State of the Digital First uh, Initiative, where all of campus, a larger institution, University of Western Sydney in Australia, and indeed all of nation in the case of UAE. But what I found more typical is a specific academic discipline embracing the technology. So this is a snapshot of some of the medical and health science folks. We'll be hearing from uh, Manchester Medicine and Liverpool Dentistry today. I've also seen that business schools have embraced the technology. Wharton and Sloan at uh, MIT being in the top 10 uh, graduate schools according to Financial Times certainly have embraced the technology. So let's have a look at the big picture of mobile learning. Back in 2011, Murphy from the Queensland University of Technology reviewed the literature and looked for common themes amongst the literature on mobile learning. He identified that as personalization, collaboration and informalization. Now, Metropolitan, uh, Manchester Metropolitan uh, recently ran a pilot as well in health sciences uh, and, and social care. And this was around using iPads to promote uh, collaborative learning. 
very similar feedback in the qualitative research around the students. It's all about collaboration and engagement for them and accessibility of content. But interestingly, they also looked at the staff. And staff found that using this technology introduced them to new teaching modes, different pedagogies. Uh, they also found that it was a great way of improving their digital literacy. But I want to focus on the students because, let's face it, it's all about the students. Now, we know for a fact that student access to the internet via mobile devices has increased significantly over the years. This survey of high school students found that one day a week was being spent online. That's tripled in a decade. I can only assume that the quality of cat videos on YouTube must really have improved over the last 10 years. But if we look at university students, what's happening there? Now, the ECAR study last year, largest study of undergraduate students, N equals 75,000 students from over 200 US institutions, but now also 15 other countries polled. And as we can see, smartphone ownership is over 70% internationally, tablet device ownership over 50%. But let's look at another comparative institution, another Russell Group University, Oxford. Now, at the Fresher survey last year, they found there in blue is a laptop, almost ubiquitous ownership of laptop. In uh, orange, we have tablet ownership, 25%. So lower, certainly, than the US and uh, also uh, the antipodes, but quite high. The graph on the right, iPad in blue, other devices in green, we can see a very strong growth there and certainly the iPad dominates the market. Now, when we're talking about consuming content uh, on the iPad, that can include e-books, that can include using apps that are specific for education, and also open educational resources such as iTunes U. I'm going to focus on apps first. There are too many to keep count of. Uh, there are tens of thousands of apps, for, such as Penultimate, uh, Math Studio, uh, for Creative Arts, the Sketchbook Pro, and so on. What I thought might be a more interesting exercise is to look at just what some of your colleagues are using. Now, I had 60-odd academic staff at the University of Western Sydney last year. Using Google Docs, I asked them to input their favorite app. Just one word. Uh, in the tea break, I then cut and paste that into a web uh, solution called Wordle to make a word cloud. The more a word was repeated, the bigger that word was. So for staff at UWS, it was all about cloud storage. Dropbox was hugely important. Cloud on was hugely important. Evernote for note taking was important. I see iTunes U there was important. I'm somewhat disappointed that zombies was important. Clearly, one or two folks had too much time on their hands. And also important to them was Mobile Learn. That's the app for their VLE, in this case, Blackboard. For KCL, the VLE of, in, of choice is Moodle, uh, aka Keats, and the app was introduced in 2013. Incidentally, a lovely suite of tools called Quip is uh, newish new on the market, which is a wonderful collaborative tool that perhaps I could have used instead of Google Docs. Now, I pointed out that health science was particularly strong. So, in Singapore, the Lee Kong Chian School of Medicine, which is an interesting partnership with Imperial College and Nanyang in Singapore, have kicked off a one to one program for all the med students. It's all about the flipped classroom to them. It's about giving them access to material before they come to the small group learning, and then they're part of the readiness assurance program. So, really interesting to see them kick that off. I had the pleasure of visiting UC Irvine in California about two years ago. Uh, Warren Weichman is the intensivist who runs the e-learning side of things. Dr. Weichman took me around to show me the students in action. It was quite interesting to see that now that we have the iPad mini, they no longer need to have bespoke white coats. Uh, it fits into a normal white coat. But more significant was looking at the apps they use. They've moved towards small group learning, still revolving around PBLs, problem-based learning. The, uh, the apps they use for collaboration were mind mapping apps like Poplet, uh, like Adobe Ideas, like Group Board and MindNode. Now these were used to throw, well they use Poplet, let me tell you how I saw that being used. The tutor asked, uh, presented a patient. Um, the patient presents, for example, with distended liver and jaundice and lethargy. 
students type in what you think are the main ideas. And the students typed in their differential diagnoses. It might have been hep A, it might have been hemochromatosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And for the next half hour or so, they debated this until they basically drew down a, 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 a um, diagnosis. And then there are reference apps, and there are thousands of them in the health sciences, ranging from radiology tools like Sono Access to Skyscape and other reference tools that are there. Now, importantly, the dean reported that although students came to the university with average scores compared to a national cohort in the US, after a year in the iMedEd program, they were performing better than the national cohort of medical students. Interesting feedback. I think skills training is an area too that's really quite important in not only undergraduate but postgraduate training. I've seen apps such as Simon being used to uh, simulate bedside monitors for midwifery students at Charles Sturt University in Australia. But here at King's College, it's great to see some laparoscopic surgeons creating what I think is a wonderfully simple solution that does the trick. Yep, that's a cardboard box. Uh, but the feedback from a small group, N equals 10 surgeons, found that it was very useful to use the iPad for skills training in this situation. I think it's very creative. Evaluation is all important. In fact, Professor John Hattie is at the Graduate School of Education at Melbourne University. In his text, Visible Learning, which is a meta-analysis of over 800 papers on student achievement, he found that the more timely the feedback to the student, the higher their motivation and the better their achievement. So it's very important. And I've seen some lovely examples using the iPad to enhance uh, uh, the evaluation of students. We're going to hear from Ben after the tea break and his work with Luke Dawson on the Lift Up pro project. Really powerful stuff there. We'll also hear from Colin from Manchester Med School on what they're doing and some of the developments of software there too. But a very simple solution that I saw at the University of Adelaide was just using PDFs. Now Mario Ricci teaches anatomy there and he enhanced PDFs on the PC or Mac use them on the iPad for a marking rubric within the lab prac itself, so the anatomy prac. He was able to mark this up, export it as a PDF, and email it to the student before they even left the North Terrace campus. Very timely. I, uh, York St. John are doing some great stuff in the education school. Now, they're using clicker software. Now, I saw this at UC Irvine as well, where you can poll students uh, to get an idea of where they're at they use the eClicker app at York St. John. There are limitations uh, with that, uh, class sizes and so on. The teaching students were using it in classroom prax. I've seen other solutions that are much more uh, stable, such as Go Soapbox, a web solution that University of Western Sydney uses. And it has some lovely features like the confusion meter, where during a lecture, uh, students can basically rate how confused they are. So you can change your pace, go back and explain a concept. Uh, Nearpod is used by a number of folks. Uh, in fact, Colin has used it in small group uh, teaching. But again, stability is an issue with class size. The web solution Poll Daddy is something I've used in the past and is very stable, platform agnostic, web-based, although there's a lovely app as well. And Responseware have the Turning Point uh, app, which is very powerful indeed. That's enough of medicine. I've focused on them a great deal. What about the humanities? Well, I can kick off by saying that there's some great work at uh, Open University. In fact, I linked to a paper on language teaching using iTunes U that uh, you can grab off my website later. But Northwestern is doing some lovely stuff in Chinese language. Let's hear from a student. With this, we've been doing like recording speech and sending it in for files so she can listen to us and then give us personal feedback, individual feedback. Um, and and I think stuff like that has really been helpful too. It, it kind of, not only for the learning aspect of it, but it helps get the students engaged. So if we focus on the humanities, there's a nice paper on the liberal arts from Idaho State uh, that I have linked to worth looking at. Now the student here spoke about creating content, and I think that's really powerful stuff, a constructivist approach really. Uh, where the student creates and engages them more. In this case, it was audio files. They use the free Apple app GarageBand to do that. You can actually edit uh, the file really easily. You can create music as well. I've seen, for example, at the Conservatorium of Music at Griffith University in Australia, the iPad Orchestra. We're using these sorts of tools. They 
they can perform live. Now video editing is another feature that's quite powerful and the iMovie app is a, a freebie that's available for the iPad as well. One can actually configure up the iPad to be a very powerful high definition camera. Iographer for example uh, produce a case and lenses and lighting you add a good microphone and you've got some pretty good kit there. I've used an app called Coach's Eye. I've seen in clinical settings in both uh, the health sciences and uh, psychology where you can mark up and edit video. And in the tea break, uh, perhaps I could uh, show that if you're interested. Now, what are the affordances that can be bought by using an iPad? The small outfit Unitech in Auckland, New Zealand has done a great job, Cochrane and Oldfield, uh, wrote a paper some years ago where they looked at the affordance that the iPad bought in a number of disciplines, in this case business, but they also looked at architecture and music. For example, they looked at geolocation. There's a GPS chip in the iPad. Well, that maps very closely to work by Harrington and Harrington on situated learning. So I'll show an example of that in a moment, but there are apps to assist that. Or augmented reality. Uh, or RASMA is an app I've seen used in, in human geography at University of Western Sydney. Uh, I've seen apps being written by folks like Nang Yang in Singapore for anatomy teaching with augmented reality. But let's look at situated learning. University of Sydney School of uh, Molecular Bioscience made a very obvious observation, and that's that lab prax hadn't changed a lot here from the 1800s we see at Oxford to a contemporary lab prac. Sure, there's better gender equity, there's better occupational health, they're wearing white coats, uh, but they certainly were going through uh, handwriting their lab notes, it was, it was harder to reproduce experiments, so they decided that students should uh, access uh, imagery, access material using their devices, write up their, their lab prac in an e-portfolio format. And what Gareth Denyer found by essentially he calls it flipping the lab uh, learning experience is that all of the graduate attributes that they required were addressed but it went a bit further. Students were being more creative, there was much more reflection and there was higher individual accountability. And at Greenwich they're doing similar things with first year science students. I highly recommend uh, this document, the Good Practice Guide for Mobile Learning that was put out by UCISA and, and Oxford uh, last year. It has case studies from various universities, in this case Gre uh, our friends at uh, Greenwich are mapping to the JISC information kit for mobile learning from 2013. Now Adelaide is a university where the science faculty made a decision, Executive Dean Bob Hill made a decision to give every first year student an iPad. We're up to about year four now. And the, one of the drivers was student retention. He thought that this engaging technology would assist in retaining students. That's proven to be correct. The other driver was to bring down the cost of textbooks. Now, first year in, publishers did respond, ebooks were offered, some of them not terribly flexible, so like some of the earlier vital source offerings. But now he's moved to open education resource texts. He's moved to staff creating their own iBooks uh, using software I'll explain in a moment. And the cost is zip, nothing. Interestingly, a recent report from Brigham Young and Michigan universities found that OER, Open Education Resource Texts, uh, had students performing just as well, if not better. Again, I have a link to that. And importantly, students reported, over 80% of students reported that the iPad helps motivate them to learn. Now in science, let's, watch, let's see what's happening with the Faculty of Science and Technology at Westminster. And I think we have a couple of folks from Westminster here today. Uh, let's watch that space because over 2,000 iPads were distributed this Michaelmas term, this first term, September this year. So let's now move on to open educational resources. I wish I had more time to talk about open research. That's a very important area. Folks like JISC and others are following this one, and certainly the Finch Report in 2013 here in the UK argued that any publicly funded research should be made available to the public. But what I'd like to focus on is iTunes U. Now iTunes U has been around for a while, and folks like Open University certainly have run with this technology. Uh, copyright's always an issue with online material. Well, this uh, follows the Creative Commons uh, movement. Now that kicked off from Stanford University. Professor Larry Lezik there has since moved to Harvard uh, got this going where with 
attribution of the material, it can be used elsewhere. In fact, if I look at a, a couple of the courses here, it's interesting to note that, say, the Duke University chemistry course on the third line, if you go to that, you'll find a lot of materials from MIT or the Khan Academy. As long as it's attributed, you can use it. So the, the academic becomes not only course uh, content creator, but curator. I think that's an interesting move. Now, open universities tell us that small, snappy videos are very important uh, because they grab a student's attention. Now, there are some lovely examples of that in skills training, uh, how to take a skin biopsy, for example, or how to run a northern block, block in uh, molecular biosciences. But in this case, in physics, it's to introduce a concept. Here we discuss the forces between two surfaces in contact. Closely related to these are the forces required to deform an object. We have the advantage that we can feel contact forces almost directly. Contact forces arise from electrical interaction and quantum physics, but that's another story. And I'm sure you're all willing to lie on a bed of nails for your students. Now, look, that's not to say that uh, full lecture recording is not important. In fact, UCL tell, told us a few years ago that for foreign students with English as a second language, very important. And, of course, for, for review, for study review before exam, uh, exams, there are piles of solutions, Echo 360, Media Site. And there's a new device called Swivel, which I need to look at because that looks really interesting. Now, we've got folks presenting the whole course on iTunes U, uh, Law at Central Queensland University in Australia is doing that. Uh, their course, they get an iPad for every student, their course is presented uh, on the iPad via iTunes U, linked to iBooks that they've created for reading material and video recordings and lectures. And yes, there are posts and in fact a semantic spine to this, a structured course with, within iTunes U. Uh, and in law, we've seen work being done at North Cumbria and locally as well. In fact, uh, Prof Marag, who uh, ran this course, uh, I bumped into at the Australian National University about two years ago, so he's moved on. But in North Cumbria, iPads for electives and, again, this use of open educational resources. It would be wrong of me not to talk about MOOCs, at least touch upon massively online open courses. Here in the UK, Future Learn's really taken hold a, a great deal. Uh, a lot of the driving of that came from open universities. In fact, the previous Vice-Chancellor, Mr Bean, I love calling him that, uh, the first Vice-Chancellor I've come across who doesn't have uh, an academic background. He was with Microsoft, since moved on to RMIT University in Melbourne, where, where he hails from. Uh, but this is a platform that's very powerful, wonderful professor presenting lectures. But internationally, I'd have to say edX have the market. That hailed out of MIT and Harvard, Coursera from work out of Stanford. And there's quite a lot of, of work on, on MOOCs, areas such as accreditation are being examined, areas such as digital, digital badging are being looked at. But really, I'm getting into edu babble here, so let's move on. Some great reviews uh, like this paper out of Columbia looking at MOOCs. Having said all that, iTunes U certainly still has a very important place. And folks like uh, Professor Hill from Social Science and Psychology at Western Sydney uh, are very passionate about it. I have trouble understanding the strong accent. I hope you can. As some people know, I personally absolutely love e-learning. And we're always looking in the school for, for new things that are of substance, rather than just gimmicks, to try and keep us uh, up with the pack or, or ahead of them, preferably. To iTunes U. OK, it is not a full-on MOOC. Uh, but that's its advantage. It's so much simpler. It's so easy. You've got to love the enthusiasm. But let me finish up with e-books. Now, a lot's happening in this turf. What, what I'm seeing a lot of is self-published content. Now, that self-published content might be EPUBs. Now, EPUBs have a benefit in that they can be created on a Mac or a PC using open source software such as Calibre or Sigil. Anyone who's done any web development, this is language you'll be comfortable with. And you can extend EPUBs using JavaScript. Open University's done some good work there. Now, on the other hand, much more interactive text can be developed, iBooks can be developed using the free software for Mac only called iBooks Author. And that can be published then to the bookstore, either free or commercially, or to the VLE, be it Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas, which is a new player in the field. A very powerful software that one can 
do on the Mac, export. Now it can also be exported as a PDF so it can be used on other platforms as well. Here's an example of one from the pathologist Tim Inglis from Southampton, now at University of Western Australia. Open the iBook from your bookshelf. You can get to each chapter by swiping from side to side. There are different types of image. Galleries you can swipe through and enlarge. And interactive images. I've written review questions at the end of each chapter. I'll leave some of the features for you to discover for yourself. And some of those features include auto-generated study cards from Glossary, uh, the ability to embed widgets such as live HTML. You could have live feeds from the web. Uh, some great work there in the book that he's produced. But where it gets interesting, as I've said before, is when students create the content. And I've seen some lovely examples. An obvious one might be journalism, in this case, from Western Ontario. Hi, my name is Jillian Wheatley. I'm part of the TIE tablet team. We are creating an iBook on the TIE's award-winning Growing the Local Dump. But other disciplines certainly doing some great work. A conservatorium of music students at Sydney University are creating these texts with embedded video, audio, interactivity. Really powerful stuff. At AUT University in Auckland, New Zealand, I'm seeing Maori students in their Te Reo Maori class, their Maori language, producing these e-portfolios. And uh, by the way, WH is pronounced in, uh, in Maori F. So Faya Tetika, or doing what is right, and clearly rugby plays quite strongly when, it's, when we're talking about New Zealand students. So let me wind up. I think there are a number of mistakes and assumptions that have been made, and one of them is that technology will answer everything. As Prof Porter from the Business School at Harvard said last year, a big mistake is people think technology is the strategy. No, we must always remember it's all about teaching and learning. And certainly folks like uh, the DVC academic at Deakin University, Bev Oliver, has told us that optimal learning occurs when we have learning outcomes clearly articulated. Again, that assessment is very, very, very important. Inspiring teachers, timely feedback, and engaging exercises. The iPad can, I hope you'll see throughout this afternoon, uh, enhance those areas. I think it's important to gauge where we're at with educational technology, and there have been a number of models presented. Ruben Puentadora is a, an, an academic in Massachusetts, hailing from uh, Argentina, who developed what's called the SAMRA model. But there are others, like the TPAC model, looking at the adoption of technology. Now, just having a PDF, as folks like the Wharton Business School do, is really just augmenting what they're already doing. But those journalism students, those Maori students, those con students were modifying, doing stuff that was new. They were transforming education. There's no doubt, oh, and incidentally, Cochrane has a lovely paper on learning spaces and mapping that to the SAMRA model. But there is certainly, there is a body of research telling us that active learning, that getting students to engage, flipped classroom, does improve student outcomes. This report from the proceeds of the National Academy of Sciences, for example, tells us that out of a sample group of 100 students, 34 will fail if lectured only, versus 22 if active learning is used. University of Western Sydney is a lovely case study and I had the pleasure of working them with them over the last few years. There are now over 42,000 iPads. Uh, if we look at how they use their iPads, some interesting patterns. Now in orange there is the iPads and in uh, green is the laptop. They're the ones to compare. Using their their virtual learning environment, in this case Blackboard, the iPad seems to be the device of choice compared to other devices. That's an outcome that Abilene Christian also found. An interesting institution I had the uh, pleasure of visiting once. A uh, very interesting town, uh, apart from all of the pickup trucks with gun racks in the back. But how students use the iPad is different to how they use other devices. By studying how students access uh, online tools such as Blackboard for course content, for every hour of the day in a week. If you map out how often students access that data, on average for 15 weeks in the semester, 
It turns out in a class with uh, laptops on Tuesday, Thursday when their classes meet is a lot of use. But uh, on the other days of the week, not much use. So one of the bits of feedback from UWS was that there needs to be professional development. And it's a matter of choosing lighthouse teachers, early adopters, who are good teachers to start with. Uh, James Avakanatis, for example, uh, who I like teasing uh, to his face, calling him the Greek god of blended learning, inspires the teachers. But more importantly, when you develop uh, communities of practice, that experience is shared. So communities of practice are all important, as are the areas when we're talking about mobile learning that Oldfield and Harrington identified integrating the pedagogy, uh, modelling the use of the technology on pedagogical use, formative feedback, again, fresh feedback, uh, and teaching and learning support, professional development, but getting the techs on board so the Wi-Fi is up to it, and I'd add senior sponsorship. Now, there's piles of professional development out there. For example, these med student, Manchester med student videos uh, are just as relevant to an art historian, how I use the iPad for iBooks, for mind mapping, and so on. Communities of practice. Huddersfield have what they call the iPad Coffee Club. At UWS, it was called iPals. Look, universities are very diverse, and the cultures are very diverse. That was apparent when I visited UC Berkeley recently. A friend there quoted their past founding president, Clark Kerr, an economist from the 60s, he defined universities as a series of diverse organisational entities and individuals only held together by a common grievance over parking. Now, although there's something to that, the mission statement of every university is research and teaching. And I think you'll find today, listening to my colleagues, that the iPad can indeed enhance teaching. Thanks for your time.